Well, so glad that you're here this morning. I uh, want to welcome you to Mountain View Church. If this is your first time, welcome. We would love to connect with you, love to meet you, love to get to know you. Uh, we'll be hanging out in the lobby right after service. Uh, on your way in, you received a uh, connection card, which many of you may have the question, why do I need this? Why am I getting a connection card? I'm already connected. Well, this connection card is a great way to communicate with us. It's a way that you can let us know how we can serve you. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Uh, throughout this series, uh, I, I wanna hear from you. Uh, I wanna hear what God's doing in your life in this series uh, that we kicked off last week called Breakthrough. Uh, what is it in your life that you're asking God for a breakthrough in? Uh, what is it that you're down on your knees begging God to move in your life throughout this series, throughout this year. Uh, so throughout the morning, uh, I want you to just take just 15 seconds, grab a pen, grab a pencil, grab lipstick if you need, write down what it is uh, you're asking God for a breakthrough in. On your way out, you can drop these uh, in the fuel cans that are in the back. They're also in the lobby, uh, or you can hand them to one of the ushers on your way out. This weekend is Martin Luther King weekend, and uh, no doubt, even many years after his death, his influence has continued to impact the lives and, and the culture here in the United States. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Dr. King he says, it doesn't matter how long you live, it matters only how well you live. Such a gospel perspective for us in our life to, to frame the way that we live and the way that we lead based not on how long we're gonna be here, but, but how well and how much like Jesus we can live. Uh, as we remember this weekend as Martin Luther King weekend, uh, I wanna encourage you to uh, frame your life, frame your living around that idea of uh, not how long we live, but how well we do it. Uh, this weekend is also uh, n not only Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, but it's also middle school camp weekend. And uh, for those of you who may not know, I have a middle schooler, and uh, she is at middle school camp with Mountain View. This is the very first time she's ever in her life or ours which are one and the same, that was funny. Uh, she, this is the first time she's been away, and so this is a big weekend. We also have uh, several others from our middle school ministry who are there at camp, at Forest Home this weekend, and our hope, our prayer is, uh, Kara and I have been praying every single day leading up to this weekend, but also all throughout this weekend, uh, we've been praying that God would move in significant ways in the lives of our middle schoolers. So I want us to just, uh, before we get going this morning, I want us to pause and pray uh, that God would move, that God would work, that God would do at camp uh, things that only he can do. So would you pray with me? Uh, Father, we're grateful. Uh, we're grateful for uh, weekends like this that remind us of the impact that you have through people uh, that we get to know about. I uh, gotta pray that as we remember the life and the legacy of Dr. King this weekend, that we would uh, frame our life differently uh, because of how he lived his. Uh, God, I pray this weekend that uh, at Forest Home, that you would move and work in the lives of middle school students. God, would you so shape their hearts and their lives this weekend that the way that they went to camp would be so different than the way that they come home because they've met with you, because they've experienced time with you. Uh, God, would you shape us as a church through what you're doing at camp as you're shaping these middle schoolers' lives? And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, can I, can I be vulnerable with you? Can I just share honestly with you? I am deathly terrified of snakes. It's great. Yeah, it's, this is a safe space. I share vulnerably and I get laughter and that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, typically when I, when I share this, I, I get one of two responses. But, but Brandon, they're just so nice. They, they help with all of the circle of life. Or, or, or it's not 
necessarily weaponized in that way. It's justified in other ways. Well, Brandon, they're more scared of you than you are of them, which is just not true. <laughs> like, I can't go into the, the snake parts of the zoo. I, I don't like watching snakes on TV. There are nights that I wake up in a cold sweat because I've had a nightmare about them. And so before you start to question, like, hey, what's really going on? This is all biblical. Like, just check out the first part of Genesis, and you'll see kind of where I'm coming from. But uh, this morning, you may, you may not be afraid of snakes like I am, but the reality is for all of us, in one way or another, we all carry fears of some kind, a fear in our life, a fear about life, a fear about the end of life. There's something in your life that is triggering and bringing about fear all throughout your life or in certain parts of your life. The comedian uh, Jerry Seinfeld famously said, according to most studies, people's number one fear is public speaking. Number two is death. Death is number two. Does that sound right to you? This means that for the average person, if you go to a funeral, you're better off in the casket than you are doing the eulogy. There are fears that we have, fears that we've carried, anxieties that have snuck in and crept into our lives that always seem to rear their ugly head. In 2019, a a study was done that found that two out of every three Americans reported feeling anxious or having extreme anxiety. A separate study found that 91% of college and high school students report consistent and significant levels of anxiety associated with stress. This is a real thing. This is something that we actually navigate. And today, we're actually going to navigate this from a biblical perspective. Last week, we kicked off our brand new series called Breakthrough, and we began to unpack this truth that the chains that hold us back, uh, the The burdens that are breaking us down, the habits and the hurts and all of the hang-ups that are holding us back in our life don't have to be there. We found out that freedom and breakthrough is offered here and right now through Jesus because of who he is, because of what Jesus says is true and who we are in him, you and I today, right now can experience freedom from the chains in our life, the chains of our mind, and the chains of of our heart, and yet, I know for so many, because I'm part of that so many, that the weight of fear and anxiety can at times feel like they are locked and weaved into the very fabric of our life. And some of the greatest battles that we'll face in life are the battles of our mind. It's why Paul said, and and we looked at last week in Romans, Chapter 12, Paul says to these churches that are spread across the Roman Empire, walking throughout this cutting-edge culture of humanity in Rome, he says this in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Our mind is an incredibly powerful thing. And Paul here is leveraging the power of our mind and says, don't be conformed, don't be shaped, and don't be molded any longer, church, to the patterns of the world, the the culture, the, uh, the, the things that the world is wrestling through. Don't be conformed any longer to that, but rather be transformed, this idea of a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. This isn't just something that Paul said so that we would have some cute spiritual saying. This isn't something Paul said just for the first century believers. This isn't something that Paul even framed as a lifestyle idea for super spiritual Christians. No, this is, in fact, for you and I as followers of Jesus. But if we're being honest, don't we wonder if it's even possible to live anxiety-free, stress-free, free from fear in our life today? I mean, is it even possible with all of the financial pressures in the world today, the bills that constantly keep coming in, uh, the, the kids who are constantly hungry and constantly growing and constantly eating more groceries, uh, the moments where 
school and educational dynamics seem to go in a different direction than we want. The relational issues, the health challenges, job stress and inflation. There's job loss and career upheaval. There's very real and very genuine and very deep trauma and wounding. Maybe for some today, the wounding even goes as far back as your childhood. And so is it even possible to be free from anxiety and fear in this world that we live in? If you've ever battled with anxiety, if you've ever uh, carried more worry than you care to admit, if fear has crippled more circumstances than you would like to say, and I just want you to hear this morning, you are not alone. You're not the only one who's struggled with this. And I believe that there's a path that God can take us down through the truth of scripture that'll guide us into this space where Jesus can overcome the anxiety in our life. But I just wanna set some expectations right from the start. Uh, as you are, are here today, maybe you even knew the topic, uh, and, and, and as you listen to me for the next two and a half hours, I just want you to know now, as, as, as we have this conversation for the next half hour, I just want you to know uh, this morning, it's not gonna just solve all of the anxiety that you wrestle with. Uh, you're not gonna walk out of this service today and say, whew, it's done, it's taken care of. No, but I do believe that we can take some steps. It's gonna take some courage. It's gonna take some time. It's gonna mean we've gotta unpack some things and understand some things about how we're wired but I'm praying today will be a breakthrough kind of experience for you. I'm praying today would be a breakthrough and a chain-breaking moment of, uh, of you experiencing the freedom that Jesus has for you. Now, to do that, I think we gotta do a little bit of brain science. So stick with me in the classroom. I promise you we will get back to church. But inside the human brain, there is this tiny little thing that's the shape of an almond called the amygdala. You may remember that from the movie Waterboy. Maybe not. The amygdala is actually a wonderful gift from God. It's amazing that God created the brain and our human brain in such a way that the amygdala is a protector of all of us. The amygdala is what springs into action anytime you see something that makes you afraid. The amygdala is this powerful tool that God has given the human mind that when we see a threat, when we see danger, it's this little guy, this amygdala, that says, hey, we need to get out of danger. We gotta get out of harm's way. In some ways, the amygdala is a form of anxiety. It's a form of fear, and that anxiety that the amygdala produces is a facilitating anxiety. When this amygdala kicks in, uh, it kicks into action in a facilitating way as, as a way to help you as opposed to harming you. Facilitating anxiety is not a bad thing. There's also this thing called debilitating anxiety where the amygdala, the, the same amygdala that helps protect us from danger can be, uh, lead us to debilitating anxiety because when the amygdala is given the driver's seat, it goes for a little joy ride and even if there's not danger around, even if there's not an accident about to happen, even if there's, heaven forbid, no snakes around, when the amygdala is in control and there's no threats, it can constantly lean into fear and adrenaline and all of that. When the amygdala is facilitating, it's on high alert. It's looking for danger in order to protect you and I. But what happens when the amygdala is in the driver's seat it now becomes this debilitating anxiety that keeps us from wanting to live life. And can I just tell you, debilitating anxiety can be completely crippling. But fear and anxiety don't get the final say because of our Savior Jesus, who according to Paul, can transform and reshape our brain. Now, I recognize as we talk about fear and anxiety that some of you may have grown up in a church tradition uh, that says, hey, you shouldn't have any 
anxiety in life. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything, and so we shouldn't, as Christians, be anxious about anything, and, and, and maybe that's the church tradition that you grew up in. The Bible says, don't worry, so don't worry. And while that may sound simple, it is just not that easy. It's not as easy as saying, don't be anxious. In fact, that may have the opposite reaction for you, and Saying don't be anxious, it may actually capitulate even more anxiety within you, but I want you to know today. I want you to hear and I want you to understand that anxiety is not a sin. Anxiety is not a sin. It's in fact just a symptom. Think about it like this. You all have smoke alarms in your home, in your apartment, in your condo. Imagine for a minute uh, your, your smoke alarms, your fire alarms go off in your house. Let's just say you're cooking and uh, the smoke alarm goes off hypothetically and it becomes the dinner bell at your house. But let's just say the smoke alarm goes off at your house and you're like, hey, there is a problem here. And so you go to your smoke alarms and take out your batteries. <laughs> that actually doesn't solve the problem at all right? Because the smoke alarm just alerts me that something is not right. There's a fire to put out. There's smoke somewhere in the house. And that's what happens with anxiety. Anxiety is the alarm that goes off in our own mind and heart. It is not a sin to wrestle with anxiety. It's a symptom. It's not a sin to be sick. Your illness is not your identity. It is not a sin to struggle. In fact, there are so many people in Scripture who wrestled with health, mental health issues and anxiety. If in your mind you think the Bible is just a collection of stories of people who had their life together, who had the perfect life, who just magically and miraculously trusted Jesus in everything and everything turned out hunky-dory, if that's your thought, then you're, you're just sorely mistaken. Because scripture is full of stories, and we're gonna look at them right now. Stories of people who struggled with anxiety, who struggled with mental health issues. Take the Apostle Paul, for example, who wrote over half of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul shares in 2 Corinthians that he was experiencing this great pressure a pressure beyond his ability to endure. And it was a pressure that was so great in his life that he says in 2 Corinthians 1 that he was despairing of life itself. King David, the hero of the Old Testament, the writer of many psalms that we still grab a hold of today. King David, throughout the psalms, we see him wrestling with his own mental health. He asks the question in Psalm 42, why are you so downcast, my soul? Then you've got Elijah, the great prophet, a heroic prophet for the people of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament and the story of Elijah, we see that he wrestles with mental health issues. Jesus himself, in Matthew 28, says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I love how scripture doesn't hide the difficult things about life. And we're not gonna hide it. So if you're carrying anxiety, if, you, if you're battling with fear, if it's overwhelming, if it's here and it's there and it's everywhere and it's intermittent and you never know when it's gonna come up, can I just tell you again today, you are not alone. You're not the only one. So Paul, who wrote that he was under so much pressure that he despaired for life, writes this in Philippians chapter four. From prison, he's awaiting trial, he's awaiting execution, and Paul says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Paul had to be the most annoying person on planet Earth. Wait a minute, Paul, you're supposed to be in prison. We're talking about 
killing you here. And yet you're saying in the worst of circumstances, in the darkest of days for you, you're telling me to rejoice? Verse five, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever's commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Which that's the part we cling on to. That's the part we cry out to God, will you bring peace to me? Will you be with me? Will you be my peace? And yet we wonder if this applies to me. What about my situation? What about what I'm walking through? What about the real anxiety that I'm carrying? And here in this text, Paul gives us one of the most demanding ethical commands in all of the New Testament. He's doubled down at this point on this whole idea that the renewal of our minds, that the transformation, metamorphosis of our minds is possible, no caveats. And God has revealed through Paul a path to overcoming anxiety, to experiencing freedom, but it's gonna take some courage. It's gonna take some work. And what we are going to have to do, if we're gonna begin to take steps toward freedom from anxiety and fear in our life, then we have to bring our anxieties and fears into the light. We've just gotta bring all of these things that we've kept so hidden into the light. Think about at your house. Uh, Think about the trees that you have planted. Maybe you've got fruit trees. Maybe you've got an avocado tree. Maybe you've got shrubbery or flowers, all of which require light in order for them to grow. There are things that'll grow on their own in darkness, things like mold and fungus and moss and and all of these things will grow without the help of light. There's a whole lot of things that'll grow in darkness, but they're not the things that we want to grow. It requires light for healthy things to grow, And so when it comes to our anxieties, if we'll take those things that we're anxious about, if we'll take those things that we're worried about, that we're fearful over, if we will bring them into the light, it's gonna take a, a, an incredible amount of courage. But if we'll bring those into the light, they'll begin to lose their power. And as we bring them into the light, the healthy things that we want in our mind will begin to grow as we bring them in the light, as we allow the word of God, as we allow the counsel of others, as we allow the work of the Holy Spirit by his power to begin to shine the light on whatever those things are, then then the fruit will begin to grow. But we've gotta be courageous. We've got to give it time. So a few areas that we can bring our anxieties and our fears into the light. We can bring our anxieties and fears into the light with yourself. You have to first acknowledge that there is something going on, which means we've gotta ask, what's happening that's causing the anxiety and the fears in my life? Paul says it this way in Philippians 4, verse eight, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul, in a way, in a phrase, is saying, think about what you think about. Your thought life matters. As he's unpacking some of these things, we've got to begin to be honest with ourselves. What is it that's consuming our mind and our heart? What is it that's controlling 
our minds? What are we carrying in our minds, in the back of our minds, in our hearts? Because the reality is denial is not just a river in Egypt. That was like the third one and you're just starting to chuckle. We gotta have self-awareness here. Self-awareness is key. Knowing yourself, not in like some Socrates know thyself moment of philosophy, but a mind transformed by the gospel moment. You gotta know yourself and know your state of mind, your, your actions and your reactions. Why did I say that? Why did I react in that kind of way when that was said when I was around? Uh, why did I respond in the way that I did in that moment? Why do I feel so overwhelmed in these circumstances? See, the problem is when it comes to self-awareness, we have an enemy that knows intimately every detail about us. And too often, the enemy knows more about us than we know about ourselves, which allows this tiny little amygdala almond in our brain to take the steering wheel. But Paul says, no, think about that which is true. Think about things that are pure. Think about things that are lovely and excellent and, and praiseworthy. See, at the root of all of our anxiety is, is fear. For to boil it down and say, anxiety is a symptom What's the cause at the root of the anxiety? What's the, what's the core emotion at that root of the anxiety? It's fear. And so Paul is not suggesting, and I'm not suggesting, that we ought to suppress our fear, that we shouldn't hide it or pretend like it's a problem. We shouldn't act like it's not affecting our life or affecting our relationships. No, it's a critical issue. And so we ought to bring it into the light identify what our core fear is, and that's gonna take some work on your part. You're gonna have to bring those anxieties and, and fears into the light with yourself. But we also have to bring our anxieties into the light with God. Make no mistake, God already knows what worries your heart. God already knows the fears that you're carrying and the anxieties that weigh you down and hold you back. We talked about this last week. We talked about it uh, in this theological word called the sovereignty of God, that God knows everything that there is and yet at the same time loves you right where you're at. And so Paul says in verse six, don't be anxious about anything now notice in the text there that there's a comma right after don't be anxious about anything. Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, did not put a period here because Paul knows that it's not that simple. And so you and I can't put periods where God has put commas in our own life. Don't be anxious, Paul says, about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says in every single situation, well, what about my situation? Yes, in your situation, bring it to God. What this means for us today that is that if it's on your heart, if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. And God cares about it because God cares about you as a dad with my kids when our kids are struggling, when they're having a tough time, uh, when they're going through something difficult, the last thing that I want is for them to navigate this all on their own, to just stay quiet about it, to just silently suffer through whatever it is they're wrestling with. I want them to come to me and say, hey, Dad, I'm having a hard time. Can I talk about what's going on? And so when anxiety comes, when fear comes into our life, what do we do about it? We pray. Oh, well, pastor, that just sounds spiritual. It is, but it's also practical. It's also proven to bring actual change in our minds and our hearts. Dr. Caroline Leaf is a communication pathologist. She's a cognitive neuroscience scientist. She has a master's and a PhD in communication pathology and a bachelor's in Logopedics specializing in cognitive and metacognitive neurology. 
Let me just shoot you straight. I don't know what any of that means. But I know she's smart. I mean, if you go to my Instagram, it says he's a husband, he's a dad, and he's a pastor. That's it. I mean, it's pretty clear and pretty simple. But Dr. Caroline Leaf is incredibly smart. And in her research, here's what she discovered. She discovered this, quote, it's been found that in 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. 12 minutes over eight weeks. And if you go in and get a brain scan, the doctor will see a change in your brain. So not only does prayer touch the heart of God, prayer changes the chemistry of your brain. And this is incredibly exciting because our brain is not fixed, which is really good news. Because when the anxiety is crushing, when there's uneasiness, when there's stress, minor stress, major stress, crushing things, debilitating circumstances, what do we do about it? Paul says, go and say thanks. Thank you, God. Acknowledge what God has already done because it is hard to spiral down the loop of difficulty and dysfunction and anxiety while at the same time being grateful for what God has done. Yeah, 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 but Brandon, there's a whole lot of bad things going on. Yeah, there are. But we can start here. God loved us so much that he sent his son. He loved us. He loved me and he loved you. God loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, who gave his life for you, who paid the debt that your sin and my sin required. We could never pay. And out of love and out of grace, he offers life to anyone who puts their trust in him. You and I have a lot to be thankful for. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves. Sometimes we just need to shift gears and and begin to worship instead of worrying, replacing that that worries and consumes our hearts with the, the worship that transforms our hearts. Sometimes we need to just remind ourselves of who God is and what God has done. Sometimes we need to choose faith over fear and move our focus off of our circumstances onto our heavenly Father who loves us, who cares for us, and who's provided a way for us. When it comes to anxiety attacks, you can actually use worship as a weapon. There's a story in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 where God's people are preparing to go into battle. And they did something a little weird. In my limited knowledge of warfare, I would not have run this play. But as the the Israelite army is preparing to go into battle, they send their worship team out on the front lines. And their weapons were their instruments. So just imagine the scene in this moment. You've got the tambourine lady and the acoustic guitar guy going out there on the front line of battle. Like, this is not the play that I would have run. If it were left up to me, I'm sending John Cena, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Vin Diesel. But no, God sends the worship team. He's got Matt Redman and Chris Tomlin and Carrie Job out there, and he's like, hey, Carrie, go tell them they're blessed. But what's amazing, as as the army of Judah goes out to battle, They face this army who came directly at them to kill them. But instead of killing them, they turned on each other and killed their own army. Before the battle started, God's people chose to worship. Before the victory was sealed, they worshiped. They didn't just praise after the victory. They praised before the victory. And listen, I know because I've carried it. It's easy to praise God when all of the anxiety is gone. It takes faith in the moment when you're hurting now, when you're feeling anxiety now, when you don't know what to do now and when you don't see a way out. But Paul reminds us that when we pray and when we worship, our focus shifts. Now, please don't hear me say that this is an if then thing, oh, if you just worship, then you'll feel fine. 
I, I'm not suggesting, oh, if you just pray more, then you'll fear less. No, I, I'm not saying that this changes your circumstances at all times, but I am suggesting that it could change our focus. Last thing, let's wrap this up. So we bring our anxieties into the light with ourselves. We bring them into the light with God. And then finally, and this is critical, don't miss this, we've got to bring them into the light with others. Paul says it this way in verse nine, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, you've seen me wrestling through this. We've talked about all of these things. Now go and live out the truth that God has for you. Listen, if you struggle with anxiety, I just want you to hear this morning, you're not crazy. We have an enemy who would like to convince us and trick us into believing that we're the only ones who carry anxiety. We've got an enemy who would love nothing more than to cripple us by convincing us that we're crazy, that we're all alone, that nobody else is going through this. Nobody else is doing what we're having to do. But friends, God has given us the church, not as a building that we sit in, but as a movement that we choose to be a part of. Not a place that we show up and consume and sit and soak and sour, but as a place that we serve and that we help people meet Jesus. And I'm telling you, at this church, this is a safe place to say, hey, I'm wrestling with something. I'm dealing with anxiety. I'm hurting right now. And what you're gonna learn and what you're gonna experience is that when you do that, they'll say, someone that you, you share that with will say, yeah, have been there too. They may even say, yeah, you know what? I, I'm struggling too. I, 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 was, I was anxious just this week. I was anxious just this morning. If you don't hear it from anybody else, hear it from your pastor. Just this morning, I stepped onto this stage with anxiety and insecurity and difficulty. I'm telling you, you're not alone. There's freedom for you in this community. And for some of you today, you just need to take the step and say, I may have felt alone, but I'm not gonna do this alone. And today, before you leave and before you turn on your car, you need to just pause in the lobby and stop at the Connection Center and say, you know what, I need to get into a small group. Because I've been trying to do this alone and I just can't. And when you get into a, a small group, you're gonna walk in there and you may be tempted to believe like, I'm all alone. You, you, you may be tempted to walk in there and bring in the fear and the anxiety that has held you back and that has crippled you. But what you're gonna experience as you begin to talk to someone, you'll find out that you are not alone. Some of you this morning just need to get into a group. You need to, you need to help your faith Find friends in the context of a, a small group. For some of you this morning, you need to find a, a good Christian therapist. We'd love to recommend some to you if you uh, need some help in what direction to go. You can email me at brandon at mvc.life and I'll send you a list of ones that we've vetted, that we've, as a staff, looked through, talked to these people so that you can know you're, you're being sent somewhere that's safe and secure. Let me just tell you, there's nothing wrong with you saying something's not right. Nothing wrong with getting help. And you'll have the chance in that therapy to, through love and discipleship, to say, I, I'm struggling, life's hard, I don't have the answers. Now I realize this is a complex topic and there's a lot of different reasons why we battle anxiety trauma, abuse, chemical imbalances, pressures, internal pressures, external pressures. Just hear from me. It's okay to get help. It's okay. Uh, this connection card, if you'll pull it out, you can write anything on it. You can write what you're praying for your breakthrough. But maybe you just want to connect with somebody. Maybe you just want someone to pray for you. 
If you'll write your prayer request down on this card, here's a promise that I'll make this week. We will, as a staff, pray through every single request that comes in. You don't have to tell us your name. The good news is God's sovereign. So even if we don't know who we're praying for, God knows exactly who we are praying for. We'd love to pray for you this week. Maybe, maybe you're here and you just need somebody to pray for you this morning. We're gonna have folks on the sides ready just to pray over you, to talk with you. But I want you to know, I want you to experience I want you to believe down to the depth of who you are that you are not alone. There's a breakthrough ready for you. Let's pray. Jesus, in moments of fear and anxiety, we're we're so quick to try to fix things on our own, to try to cope on our own, to try to figure out how to put one foot in front of the other all by ourself. But God, today, would you remind us in a tangible and practical way the anxieties and the fears that we carry don't make us alone. They make us human. So God, would you begin, even now, to bridge toward breakthrough. Would you break chains that have held us back and held us down so that we can live free? Lord, may we trust you for our freedom. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.